uh, wet Wednesday afternoon for all of you, and I'm very happy to see that you are all very much interested in this today's topic, which are concerning of the work of uh, uh, international panel of, for climate change and Kyoto agreements. We have two interesting talks today. My name is Kati Dierich, I'm coordinator of uh, Helsinki University Center for Environment, and Henvi is organizing together with ILEAPS this seminar series uh, this autumn. And our first speaker is coming from the Department of Physics. He's a professor, and his research topics concern of aeros atmospheric aerosols, and he has been awarded for his research work he has been you know, uh, called uh, Small Luchowski <laughs> Award. <laughs> I'm, I probably I know, pronounced that poorly. And he has been also being a lead author in IPPC 5 assessment report. And he's actually one of the four Finnish scientists who was chosen among thousand scientists to make a uh, the next evaluation report of IPPC. Please welcome Billy Montegero. Thank you and good afternoon. Uh, well, this title was kind of uh, given to me, so I certainly cannot, can only tell you a few percent of what IPCC really does. But I do give some facts about that to you, and also I will tell you something about uh, my own work in IPCC. But let's start with something from something very general. First of all, <coughs> I think it's fair to say that IPCC is really the leading body of doing this kind of climate assessment work in the world. Uh, what is its mandate? It's really supposed to keep a scientific view on climate change and its uh, impacts and, and so on. So it's, it's really about science, this, this whole IPCC. Uh, what it does in practice, it, it reviews and then assesses the, the latest, basically scientific, technical and other information that has been basically done all over the world. For example, we go through the whole scientific literature related to climate change in a way or another. Okay, IPCC doesn't really do, do any research and it doesn't do climate monitoring. It just uh, assess it, assesses the kind of work done by others. It does, however, influence research. For example, many climate modeling groups are kind of timing their development of the climate model based on, based on when IPCC really makes their next report and so on. So it does influence research even though it doesn't do it by itself. Okay, it's a more than 20 years old organization uh, established by UNEP and WMO. It has made four assessment reports so far. These assessment reports are the primary products by IPCC. And the last one was published in 2007, and uh, basically I think one reason why I'm talking to you here today is that the next one will be published roughly one year from now. <coughs> and basically, in addition to these, these uh, assessment reports, they do publish so-called special reports, which are of different topics and basically of more narrower, narrower view of, of, of certain things that are or might be interested to different groups of people. Okay. Uh, just a little bit about the structure of the organization. I'm not really going through this slide. I only want to say you that uh, basically <coughs> the work, the real work is done here at the bottom. So it's, it's the authors who write the report, they have with their help, contributors, and then there are plenty of reviewers, especially all of you could be reviewers of this work. And that's which really make, make that report. And each of the authors 
the writers of the report, they belong one of the three working groups here. And only one. There are hundreds of authors and each belong to one of these working groups. And what these working groups do in practice? Okay, the group one, where I belong, it's, it's about climate science, the scientific basis of climate change. Group up, groups two is, is about uh, basically the impacts of climate change and then also adaptation to climate change. And then the third one is about uh, how to miti mitigate, about mitigation of climate change. So that's, that's about the contents of the working groups. Um, how the writing or actually the preparation of these assessment reports goes in practice? Well, when I was selected as an author, we got actually an outline. We got an outline of the contents of the report, the titles of the sections, and actually the, the preliminary contents of the section was, was given to us as an outline in a very general form. I don't know exactly the process, how, how it was created, this outline, but anyway, that's where we started from. And once this work <coughs> and this process, uh, I got involved to this business two years ago. That's when we started. And uh, soon after that, we had a meeting, and based on our internal author meeting, we basically then prepared within a few months the first order draft. Or actually, we made a zero photograph, right, which was then reviewed by a very small group of, of experts. And based on that, we actually then made the second or the first photograph, which was then uh, forwarded to expert review. Expert review means that uh, basically scientists gave their comments to this report. Uh, okay, then we had a second meeting where we actually went through the review reports or the reviews. I will come back to that. And uh, based on that, uh, we then prepared basically during the last uh, spring and early summer the so called second order draft, which is now in both ex expert and government review. This is this is where we are right now. And we will have a meeting next uh, January, where we actually go through the new comments, and then we will prepare the so-called final draft, which then still goes through something before it will be finally accepted and then published. Uh, that's that's how the process goes roughly. Something about the the work itself. Okay, as I mentioned, it's it's an assessment report, which which means in practice that uh, it's not a, really a scientific review. It's not a reference book which is uh, what we scientists normally might do. We make scientific articles, we make every now and then scientific reviews, and some of us might, might even make books. But this is none of those, it's an assessment. And for me it was uh, quite a learning process to really understand what the assessment means. So we assess the existing literature, so we don't review it. Okay. Four words, which are our guidelines. I think these are clear to all. <coughs> Comprehensive, objective, open, and transparent. Especially those last two ones are a very important part of the process. And basically, the 
transparency is uh, and the openness is, is guaranteed by this, these review processes. So basically almost anyone can comment, comment the graphs. Okay. Uh, I think that uncertainties are a very important thing when we're talking about climate change and uh, this is something that is really paid a lot of attention to, to in this uh, in writing in the writing process and I come back to you to that point in a moment. Also <coughs> one more important thing is that really our work is confidential. This doesn't violate the openness or transparency because I think it, it means two things. First of all uh, it means that the uh, when we are doing our work, we are not supposed to really show the text to anyone else, except those people which we uh, ask for helping us to write the report, which are then called contributing authors. So that makes our work a little bit easier, and one, once we get the next draft, then it will be more open to anybody else. But between these drafts, <coughs> we are not supposed to show the text to anybody else, which just makes our work a little bit easier. The other thing is that we cannot really cite any, any, any of its content before it's really published. That's, that's the other thing. Which is the meaning of this word, word here? Okay. And basically, the fact that it's confidential, I will show something general about the structure of the chapter I'm working with in the later slides. But I cannot really show any details just because of this confidentiality. Okay. About the uncertainties, let's get back to that. There are two words because this uncertainty business is really important. There are two words by which uh, this uncertainty is taken care of. It's the confidence and likelihood. Confidence is the more, let's say, qualitative measure. And everybody who has uh, uh, read those earlier assessment reports have seen sentences where are saying something is, uh, is, uh, is like that at the very low confidence or low confidence or medium or high, very high confidence. So they have these five confidence levels, which are actually determined by two things, agreement and evidence. And it's not only the amount of evidence that determines how robust the evidence is, it's, it's only the type of the evidence and its quality. For example, you may have heard somebody to say that there are mo multiple lines of evidence on this. It means that, for example, there are evidence from uh, observations, from laboratory studies, or from modeling. If you have very different types of evidence on, certain, on something, then, then the evidence is certainly more robust. Or if there is more, I mean that the amount of evidence is, is larger. So it's getting more robust by that. The agreement means that uh, a different studies on something kind of agree or disagree. For example, let's think that uh, there would be like 100 studies on certain quantity. And maybe 20 says that, okay, this quantity is something like minus 5. 20 of the studies would say that, okay, it's a plus, plus 5. And then the rest would say, oh, it's, it's around 0. In that case, I would say that the agreement is low. If uh, all of this, or most of the studies would say that, okay, this value of this quantity is something like, uh, it's positive, but we cannot really give the number, then it might be something like medium. But if all the studies, or most of them, say that, okay, it's around plus five, or something like that, then it's high agreement. So, so really, that's how the agreement goes higher. 
And then it's, it's the kind of the combination of evidence and agreement that increase the confidence level so that we have a low confidence level there in the, in the bottom corner left and the high confidence there in the top, at the top right corner. But that's a quanti qualitative measure only. If we want to be more quantitative, it's the likelihood that is used. And it's really a probabilistic estimate of the occurrence of, of, of an event or an outcome. And these are kind of the likelihood scale that is used. It was used in the previous report and it is used now as well. This is also something that you can see throughout the report when reading it. Okay, that's about uncertainties. Then, okay, let's then go to this working group one, which was about scientific basis, which I am one of the lead authors. I'm an author in the chapter seven. Then there is uh, actually a review editor in chapter six. Uh, it does have, com compared to the previous assessment report, it does have a new chapter structure. It has a totally new theme, which is process understanding, which are chapters 6 and 7, where actually we finished ones are working. And uh, it has an own chapter to four things, and also to sea level change. And then a total new component is so-called new term climate predictions. Okay, what what do these authors and editors mean in practice? There are, first of all, each, each chapter of the report has uh, two coordinating authors, which actually oversee the writing process and actually link also uh, all other authors and then the other chapters of the report and actually also the technical support unit of, of, of the whole working group one. So they are kind of the bosses of, of the chapter. Then the rest authors are so-called lead authors. There are plenty of them in each chapter and actually there those guys make the actual writing process. <coughs> So probably 90% of the text seen in the final report piece is written by the authors. But of course, each chapter covers quite a wide variety of different things and we cannot really be, even though there are plenty of us, we cannot really cover all of the special topics. So in some cases, we just need help from outside. And then we can actually name Helpers, and they are called then contributing authors. And typically, if you look at the previous assessment reports, each chapter has more contributing authors than lead authors. So we do, at the end, probably can ask for 20, 30 other people, people to help us. That, that has been the case before, and I think it will be also in this round. And then there are so-called review editors, a few in each chapter, and they are actually a, then the link between these external reviewers and the authors. So they give us advice. I mean, we, get, we will get a plenty of comments. They kind of uh, make, in a way, advise us which are the most important comments and I mean we need to address all the comments but of course some prior, pri we need to prioritize them somehow because there are conflicting comments so they, they help us in that business all right this is uh, the chapter structure of, of this uh, next report of, of our working group and uh, well, it has an introduction, then it goes through 
all kinds of observations on climate change from the atmosphere, surface, oceans, and the cryosphere. Then there is a chapter about these uh, past studies based on paleoclimatic information. And then there are these two new chapters for about the process understanding. One is about this uh, carbon cycle and other biogeo biogeochemical cycles. And then the chapter seven where I'm working is the, about clouds and isos. Then there is an entirely new chapter now about the radiative forcing. A chapter about how climate models really work today, how they are evaluated, what is the outcome of that. About detection and attributing of climate change. Then, uh, if you look really, if you look at the previous uh, report. The climate change predictions were only made for the year 2100 or beyond. But this is a little bit out of our interest today. We are more interested in what happens in the next 20 or 30 years. And because of that, there is a new chapter really talking about this near term climate change. Okay. And then a whole chapter about sea level change. And then something about what happens in regional scales. So this is the structure. Okay, in this our report, there are more than two two hundred authors in total from quite a big number of countries. And this is uh, this is kind of the time scale now. What, what I actually told you already. So we are now here. The second order craft is, is right now under the view. And one year from now on, we should be pretty much finished, or, and we will be. The, the titles of the schedules are tight. They, they will not change. So we certainly have our report ready next week. OK. The number of comments what the first order draft got more than 20,000. My chapter got 1,600 of them. We have addressed all of them. It was plenty of work. Yeah, that's, that's general. Then, then I go in more detail to my chapter, which was this aerosols and clouds. This is, these are a few more slides. So, <coughs> Why is IPCC interested in clouds and aerosols? Uh, first of all, what, what do aerosols do for the climate? Uh, this slide, I hope a little bit gives you information on that. Uh, if you are in a very clean environment where there are very few aerosol particles in the, in the atmosphere, you can, you can see pretty much long distances because there's nothing that scatters the sunlight. But if you are in a polluted place, like most megacities today, you don't really see very far in most days. And that's, that's simply because of the arts of particles. They scatter very efficiently sunlight, and which means that, that also they scatter this light coming from the sun back to the space, and by that way, cool the atmosphere. OK, some aerosol particles also absorb sunlight and cause heating, but this is, this is the reason. They interact very efficiently with solar radiation, and by that, that way, influence the climate. That's one reason. Clouds. Well, clouds are very important players in the whole climate system especially the energy balance. And uh, why then isos and clouds together? Well, practically none of the clouds you can see in the atmosphere would exist without isol particles. So clouds need isol particles as seeds to really exist. And also, whether you have 
just a few or plenty of isoparticles particles influences the many properties of clouds. And by that way, isoparticles particles together with clouds are very important players in the whole climate system. So that's why there is a separate chapter on isoparticles and clouds in this report. Okay. This is uh, the contents of, of our chapter. Like every other chapter, it does have an executive summary. I think most of the chapters are pretty tough reading for, even for scientists, because it's, it's very detailed uh, text on, on, on various aspects. So basically, <clears throat> if you really want to get the main points, read the executive summary. All the important things are said in this executive summary. How long text is that? It's typically a couple of pages mm -hmm. in front of each. All chapter half, chapters have this. And of course, the whole report has them the separate thing called the summary for policymakers, which is more readable to, to everybody. Something like 20 pages of text. Okay. Then we have an introduction. Also brief, and then actually, the <coughs> eighty percent of the text is in these three sections. So we talk about clouds, isos, and then also about interactions. And then something about few issues that uh, that actually were asked us to tell about about the forcing. This is where the rest of the chapters are most interesting. They just want to know that what is the forcing caused by isos and clouds. They are they are not interested in the actual science, they, they are interested in, the, in these numbers that are provided in this subject section here. And also, links to presentation and then something about the climate manipulation. Basically, all these subjects and summarize and as a somehow the advances, so what has been made since the previous report related to observations, modeling, and then understand how well we understand the different processes behind behind this, what we can see or in practice. Uh, the radiate forcing, that is the main product of, of this section, of course, and uh, this, is, uh, this is how things looked like in, in the previous report. We have see, you can see there the positive forcing by greenhouse gases, which means that they tend to warm the planet. But then we have these uh, negative forcings by isolated particles and clouds. And these are the direct effect, which is just the scattering of isolated particles. And this is because of the clouds. It's so the forcings are negative, which means in practice that isos and clouds are actually cooling currently the climate system relatively what they did in the pre-industrial atmosphere. And then black carbon and snow is related to isos as well. So what they had is uh, this direct radiative forcing and then one part of this cloud-related, what we call indirect radiated forcing. So it did not include all the possible effects related to puzzles and clouds. And that's an important thing. Which means that these error paths, these are error paths in this forcing, which is the largest here, it's actually much larger in reality than given there. Simply because that it doesn't include everything. What is done in this new report is actually that these radiative forcing definitions are a little bit kind of, I wouldn't say changed, I would say that they have been expanded and renamed a little bit. So we had these uh, direct and indirect radiative effects, they are now called a bit, with a little bit different names. And then also another thing is that uh, we we don't only talk about radiated forcing, but also adjusted forcing, 
which means that uh, we actually take a little bit of the response of the climate system to forcing a small part of that part of the forcing, which is then called adjusted forcing. I cannot really tell you exactly why this is done, so it's too complicated here, but there are good reasons for doing that. And because of doing that, in the next report you can then see these kind of uh, names for these forcings, which are a little bit different from the previous one. But basically the definitions have by themselves haven't been changed. So, so these new names or quantities that, is, that are used in the new report are still pretty much consistent with the previous report. Okay. This is uh, one thing that uh, many people have been very interested in. Do, do cosmic rays and then thereby the, actually the, the sun affect the climate change and how much. So actually the activity of sun determines that how big fraction of the cosmic rays enter the Earth's atmosphere and that would change the climate. So we actually do assess that component as well. We talk about correlations between cosmic rays and clouds, and then about really the physical mechanism that lie behind these possible changes. I cannot tell you anything about the contents, but I, I think we do a pretty good job in assessing the current scientific knowledge. Precipitation. Uh, quite often people only pay attention to temperature. Well, that's, that's clearly a climate variable. But I would claim that for the whole Earth system, precipitation is even more important. Especially how much and where and when it's precipitated. We know some general things. It's very likely that when uh, the climate warms, they, we get more precipitation, but in a, in a nasty way that those, those regions that are wet already, they just get wetter, and those, those regions which tend to be dry on the average get just dry. So it's not really a fair, fair to. The precipitation patterns will change in a way that, that's not really that useful for, for humankind. That's, that's very likely to be happening. But besides that, we know that, and we are just starting to understand that the, if you really are in a certain region, the precipitation patterns and their behavior is, is not only influenced by the climate change itself, but it's also influenced by changes in also concentrations and properties. And that's, that's an important part of the game. But this is just something that the, our understanding is gradually starting to increase. And there's one chapter talking about this, one subsection in our chapter talking about this issue. And finally, about climate geoengineering, climate manipulation, we talk about that. We just assess a few methods and their scientific understanding. We don't talk anything about the costs or ethical issues. It's not our duty in, in this chapter. Just, just the scientific basis about the methods and then how the climate system might respond if somebody would really do something like that. Okay, I think that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I think we have plenty of time for questions. Yes. Does anybody have questions? You told you had to learn the difference between assessing and reviewing existing papers of science. What was it? What was the difference? Okay, it's it's very hard to explain. I, I I kind of know it in my mind, but how how would I put it down? In a review, you basically in a scientific review, you normally go through the uh, basically all the publications related to that topic you are reviewing. And uh, 
then it's, it's dependent on, on how far you really want to go in a review to really consider that which individual study the quality of the work. I mean, this synthesis, it's, it's, it's not really required in a review. Whereas in this assessment, actually, the thing is to create an opinion based on the available knowledge. Combining all the scientific information, then actually say something uh, in, a, in a quantitative sense. Make a statement with that we can see it, say it with the high low or this kind of confidence that this thing is such a way. So that's the, I, I don't know if this explains it. Maybe it could be said that you are, in a way, you are, sen you are not synthesizing this work from other people. You are creating your own assessment of the overall situation, and, and uh, that's what you present. But no, no, not quite, because we are really trying to synthesize the, the yeah. other's work in a way that, uh, I mean, everything we make state about is based on other's work anyway. It's based, yes, but what you write is not their exact opinion. It's no, your no, own. No, no, we, we need to create kind of our best estimate on the general opinion. It's, it's, it's hard to explain, but it's not something like that, yeah. You mentioned about you received uh, 60,000 comments of the first draft. Whose comments those were? The reader, authors, or, or who gave the comments? Uh, just the, the, the yeah, it was the external review, so okay. it meant that basically anybody ha who has published at least one scientific paper could give a comment. So not, not really anybody. Yeah. So you had to have some kind of scientific background. And then there was a system that you could log in, fill a form, and once you have done that, you get the permission to give a comment. That's how it works. So this is the question of openness and transparency. Yes. So. And it's exactly the same system now, so it's open. You can go there. I have the link somewhere. I didn't put it there. Sorry for that. But there is a link. And if you want to comment, you can go there. I think most of you can really comment if you want. Okay, Where does the funding for the project come from? Uh, the funding... You mean this uh, running this this whole system? Ah, I don't know which from which the kind of the IPCC headquarters is that gets the funding, but their budget is very low, and and we authors we are not paid of this, so we do this voluntarily, and our institutes are kind of committed to take, be part of this process, so that's it's, it's let's say that the resources are. 99% kind of based on voluntary base or then of natural institutes want that they want to be part of this business. Uh, yeah, I have a couple of questions actually. The first is simply how much time does this take? How much time does it take you to do this work as a lead author? Uh, I would say that the When we are preparing the next drafts, the, the last one or two months are very busy and take a lot of time, a lot of time. I think that's worth it. But then, of course, after getting the next draft done, waiting for the comments, then you don't you do nothing. Really. You're just waiting for, and of course, you are reading scientific articles to prepare to write the next draft. But that's, I would say that just personally, just the. Just doing really this in practice, maybe I've spent one or two months, but then because we need to be aware of, of the existing scientific literature, I cannot even count the number of hours of reading scientific articles. Mm -hmm. So if you were teaching a lot, for instance, you couldn't kind of detach yourself from teaching for, for a month and a half or something, so people who are teaching a lot might not be able to act as lead authors from a practical point uh, of view. Well, you just need to spend more hours yeah. <laughs> during uh, those, <laughs> those times, yeah. My other question was about this government um, participation. Mm. Uh, IPCC reports are really interesting because they are not just 
they, they don't only make policy summaries or summaries for policy makers and hand them over and hope that the policy makers will read them. They have policy makers actually sit, sitting down with the scientists reviewing the work, mm. as you mentioned. Now, this is as much as I know about it, and probably you're not you know, doing this part yourself, but um, do you know anything more about it? What do the, first of all, are all the governments obliged to do this reviewing, and who in the governments actually does this reviewing? What are they looking at when they review these reports? And how, in any way, are they able to influence the reports? Well, I don't know, maybe the next speaker has more about that. Not really, I'm, I'm not very much into IPCC, I have to say, but uh, I, I understand broadly uh, what you're saying, that, that the um, it's an in-kind contribution, your work, uh, from the Finnish government, so to say, the Finnish government or structure, your, your institute is, 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 is paying for that. And then there is a structure to, um, which is uh, governmental representatives who actually, they do approve of the uh, yeah, I think I think those, those what you are referring to are taking place here in the green parts. Yeah. But I don't. I don't see those parts. In yeah, I way. thought you were. I see thought I'm parts. not directly influenced by yeah. people. So, so we, of as an authors, are really independent of all that. But there is one part: expert and government review yeah, before yeah. the final draft. Yeah. So you. Yeah. See so we will get some comments. So yeah. let's see what, what there is in those yeah. comments, and we need to respond to them. So this something from there comes to this part. So I wonder. Right. I'm wondering whether they will kind of. Um, ask you to focus on certain areas that would be important for the governments, like societal issues. Maybe that's why there is this new chapter on, on um, well, yeah. first of all, the, the emphasis on regional, regionality, because all governments have their own regional issues regarding climate change, and the societal impacts, and all the other impacts you mentioned, mm -hmm. and um, what was it, predictability and projections or something yeah. like that of climate change. I this sounds like something coming from the society. Yeah, but I think it was, it was all already coming when we started, so it was part of this outline that, yeah. that was I'm given pretty, to us. I'm pretty sure the governments have to be involved in that phase as well, co-designing the report. I, uh, I would guess so. Yeah. I don't know how, but I would guess so. But this is a big and important part of the IPCC report, that it really is intergovernmental, as its name suggests. Mm -hmm. And there was one question behind yes. it. Thank you. Uh, concerning uh, this type of environmental studies, um, what do you think, can corruption be a problem? Uh, uh, in, uh, since there are many links, uh, that might, might any private institution support any, uh, any personal interests of, of any of the links, uh, let's say, in, when it involves tens or hundreds of people? Is it possible, in, in, through your eyes, uh, like, uh, or what would be what would be actually the, the reason for such? Uh, for, 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 for yeah, yeah. For, for me, as a, as an author, I don't really see any easy way to go that. But maybe my personal view is too naive. But but for me, it, it seems it, it would be very difficult. It seems that when it goes through so many uh, check checkpoints. And, and reviews and uh, oh, and uh, answer, uh, sorry, the, uh, what the yeah, yeah, then uh, yeah, you could you say probably that the, there are so many people checking the text and uh, assessing it. And one one thing I didn't actually mention explicitly was that, especially in this working group one, which is scientific basis. So basically, the whole report, all the source of information we use is uh, peer reviewed scientific literature. We are not allowed to refer to any anything else. That's that's our only source that, that the whole work is based on. Working groups two and three are not quite that strict because there are simply isn't enough just scientific work based on what they can be assessed. So they, they are not that strict but we are very strict on that. We are just using very little literature as, as, our, as, a, as a base of our assessment, which also helps this thing, I think.
Yes. Yes. And then, then take this free and then continue next. Yeah, I, I just want to ask about Finland has a national climate change panel or committee, and there are several professors, yes. also from Wiki here, some professors. So how is this committee or panel linked to this work? I don't know exactly. I, I was asked to give them one. I was, I, actually, I was actually talking to this panel once, but it wasn't about this work. It was one part of this work. I, I would think that they, I don't know, because they're, I don't know, but I would, I would think that they might be somehow involved here, but I don't really know. So you are not in contact normally with them? I haven't been contacted except that they asked me to give one presentation to them once. Do you yeah, I, I, I just want to add that I think that the, the panel actually is very independent, so they more or less decide amongst themselves what they what they uh, want to do and how they want to be involved. Yeah, they, they are working about Finnish, Finnish climate change. Yeah, I think the emphasis now is on on national, mm. nationally important okay. issues. So it's like a parallel work. Yeah. Okay, here was one question, and then you and let's continue after these questions, please. Yeah. Um, so, cosmic rays are a topic that get a lot of attention, um, both within and outside the scientific community, and I'm wondering what kind of reaction. Um, you and the other authors are expecting um, others to have in response to this new section on it? Well, we were expecting to have very a lot of comments in the previous round. And we got a lot of, uh, we got quite a few comments, but uh, mostly positive. And uh, we have done, I think we have done a pretty good job in revising the text now and uh, I, I wouldn't expect anything dramatic from now, from, from outside, but because uh, everything we say there is, is, is very much supported by the existing literature. Of course, the individual studies keep, keep kind of results that are partly conflicting themselves. So it's, it's a hard time to make a fear assessment of that, but uh, I think I think we have succeeded quite nicely in that. I, it, I think it's a coherent presentation on cosmic rate, race climate thing, what, what is written there. I, I wouldn't expect really anything dramatic. Just to be clear, when you say that there's a positive response, you mean people are saying, yes, you're presenting this in a way that's fair? I, I would expect that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> I was wondering, how, how can you and like stay in neutral and um, when you get like completely contradictive information like different people writing about the same topic but completely different things maybe that's not such a big problem in your part but more in the like, second third part well, do you then mention all the different uh, yeah yeah actually it's, it's about this agreement I mean we do have material that has low agreement. I mean that individual studies, studies can give totally opposite opinions on certain things. And then it's just our, okay, what we do is that if possible, we make a statement that uh, which one are probably more correct or not. Or th and, and then we fairly no normally try to say that in this topic there is no general scientific agreement. That's, that's really written in the report, if that's our final outcome of what's our interpretation of the existing information. Okay, thank you, Mini Manti.